o'clock in the morning on Sunday and go, hey, son, can we put something on the computer? <laughs> That's what he called it, put something on the computer. And I ended up having to literally type all of his sermon notes at about 9 o'clock on Sunday morning and then get over here and load it up. So I don't do that to the team, so I, at least give me that credit. Anyway, thank you, guys. That was awesome. Um, so good to be here with you today. Uh, we're going to be continuing um, in a theme that was established a couple of weeks ago. And by the way, this was the message I was going to bring last week. How many are glad you didn't have to listen to me preach last week? And what I mean by that is because it was a powerful Holy Spirit service. Amen? Uh, I mean, we had a time of worship, and we just led right into prayer, praying for healing. It's a powerful time. Amen? God's up to something. Just like we sang a few minutes ago, he is up to something. I believe that. He is definitely up to something. I want to be part of what he is up to. Amen? I think you do, too. So this is what I was going to preach last week, um, and it's that, out of that story in the book of Mark in, in chapter 9, but let's open our usual play, way, please, if you could show it on the screen, what we start off with. I open my heart to receive from the Word of God. God's promises are true, and they are true for me. So last week, or last time, we did indeed look at that story of Mark 9. Uh, it's a story of a man that brought his young son to Jesus because he was uh, his son was uh, possessed by a demon. I mean, I can only imagine as a parent seeing that. And this demon not only had robbed the boy of speech, but he would often throw the boy into convulsions and make him foam at the mouth. What a, what a scene that was. That's a pretty grim scene. And to add to his father's dismay, he had brought his son to Jesus' disciples, and they were not able to do anything to deliver the son from this demon. So that's the setting. Um, I did preach part of my message two weeks ago on that. I want to give you the back half today. Uh, but before, uh, before we do that, let's get a little bit of context. Let's take a look at the story. It's in Mark 9. It's on the screen in your notes. It says, When they came to the other disciples, they being Jesus, Peter, James, and John, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he said, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who was possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I, have, shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It often... Throw, uh, it, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity and help us. <clears throat> if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit you deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive him out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. Okay, so last time we looked at this story, and, and I, took a, I took the angle of the spiritual warfare in this story. Did you know that you're a spiritual warfare? <laughs> you better believe we're in spiritual warfare. I mean, as a believer, you're in spiritual warfare. And I'll tell you what, you make a statement. You, we make claims in this church that God is up to something, that he's healing, that we're going to see restorations of families. We're going to see uh, people set free from addictions. You make these claims you better believe you have an enemy that is going to say, oh, yeah, we'll see about that. 
That's, that's exactly what he does. We are indeed in warfare. This isn't in your notes, but just a little quick review of the last message. We talked about the powers of darkness are on the prowl. All I, all I meant was that is they don't rest. <laughs> Satan doesn't look at you and say, you know what, Chris had a really rough week. He's tired. I think I'll leave him alone. No, that's when he goes in for the kill. Amen? You better believe it. We also said that we fight the powers of darkness by being strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. <laughs> Don't try it on your own. We also said that we, we have the same power in us that God exerted when raising Christ from the dead. Man, that is an amazing point right there. I mean, we have that kind of power in us as believers. And lastly, we said that darkness trembles at the very name of Jesus. And so with that, today I want to look at the human side of the story. There is a human side to all of this. Whereas there's always a human side because with God, it's always about his people. He loves his people. We're the only ones made in his image. He gave us emotions. He gave us a free will. He grieves when we grieve. When we grieve, he hurts when we hurt. He, he uh, is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those that are crushed in spirit. There's always a human side to the drama. God is not an uncaring distant God. He is aware of what you're going through. Can I just say that? There's always a human side to the story. This is a story where human weakness comes face to face with the power of heaven. I want to ask you, do you feel ordinary at times? Ordinary. What I mean by that is maybe like nothing special, perhaps even lacking. I know I did. In fact, I'll be honest with you, when I was young, I actually relished that. My ideal was to blend into the woodwork. <laughs> Don't ask anything of me. Whatever you do, ask me. I'll hit it out of the park. I'll always get good grades because i that was part of my perfectionism. I found validation in that. I'll just be a good boy. I'll go in my room and play. Just don't ask anything of me. And I remember it was such a stretch, such a stretch for me when I was younger, much younger, to get up on stage and play guitar. It was different. The stage looked different back in those days. It was, it was further back. It was all brown, very heavy uh, wood. And we had pews that are about half, half the length or less than half the length of, of those uh, right there. We had one going that way and one going that way. And Bob Redden used to sit, <laughs> sister, right? Bob Redden used to sit right over here and play guitar, and uh, he was kind of a country musician. That was his style, and he taught me how to play in church, and I would just sit behind him, and I had no idea what I was doing, <laughs> and I would play with my, I would not turn my volume up because I was quite sure I was wrong. Whatever I was doing was probably wrong, and I was just going through the motions, but, it, but even that, I was a nervous wreck because I wanted to blend into the woodwork, I, it was in my nature that I just wanted to be ordinary. I didn't want people looking at me. I didn't want the spotlight on me. So I sat behind him. I made sure people couldn't see me and that they surely couldn't see my hands because what I was doing was not what Bob was doing. I can tell you that. <laughs> and then many, many years later, I learned to play a little bit better, a little bit better. I started playing behind DeWitt. Even then, I was glad to blend into the woodwork. I wanted nothing to do with the spotlight at all. People told me when I was younger, you have a future in leadership. God's got a calling on your life. I can see you taking your father's, following in your father's footsteps. And I used to say, that's absolutely not true. And in fact, I'll show you. <laughs> I'll show you that how wrong you are. And I went in the other direction and got into addictions and my life was a mess. But God saw something in me that, he didn't, that I didn't see in me, amen? Did you know that God doesn't rally around how we see ourselves? Somebody needs to hear that. He does not rally around your opinion of yourself. See, we want to blend into the woodwork. We want to, we want to hide. But God is calling us out. He's, got, he's calling us out of that. He's saying, yeah, you feel ordinary, but that's not an indictment. Did you know that God isn't condemning you for feeling ordinary? Amen? He made you ordinary. Why? Check this next statement out. God made us ordinary so that we would rely on him to do the extraordinary. You get what I'm saying? God's not condemning you for being ordinary. He made you that way for a reason. 
It surely wasn't to make you feel self-conscious about it. Oh, boy, I'm really ordinary, man. I got nothing here. No, he made us ordinary, so we rely on him to do the extraordinary. Another way of saying it is this. God wants to invade our ordinary with his extraordinary. Amen. And I believe he's doing that even now. I believe he's already doing it. Do you feel, do you feel a stirring in this church? I do. I feel a stirring of what, something God, God is up to something in this place. And uh, it's, I mean, it's demonstrated by what we've seen, a tremendous, powerful service last week. Before that, we had, we had people becoming members of the church. That was awesome. We had baptisms. We had six baptisms a few weeks ago. We had an awesome uh, picnic, by the way. I remember who threw those water balloons. My revenge is the best kind of revenge. It's patient. It's very, very patient revenge. So just, just, just saying. But God is indeed pulling us out of our ordinary into his extraordinary. Look what it says in Ephesians 6. Verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. In other words, this is saying be strong in God's extraordinary power and not your ordinary power. You get what I'm saying? Man, I remember, I, I, guys, I, you know, I don't want to talk too much about my story because I sure don't want to glory in any of my past that God rescued me from. But I remember when I first decided to get sober I had lost everything. It took that. And unfortunately, God just made us that. Sometimes we got to get caught before we can be taught. I wish I wasn't that way. <laughs> but, that's, you know, that's just how it is. God knows what it's going to take to get our attention. And he allows us to come to the end of ourselves. And sometimes it's at that rock bottom that I realize that he was a rock at that bottom. <laughs> Amen. And so, you, 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 I, I remember... This whole idea of learning how to live in a whole new way. I drink, I just want to tell you, I drink every day. I was one of those kind of alcoholics. I drink every day. And here, I, something that was just such a part of me, immediately I'm not doing it anymore. What in the world am I going to do with all this free time? <laughs> right? And of course, that became a playground that the enemy could come in and, and plant thoughts on my head. Some of them were something like this. All right, yeah, you go ahead and play this little Christian thing. It's all right. I'll be over here. You know, you know, I'm faithful over here. You know, this. I'll, whenever you're done with this little experiment, you can come back and I'll I'll be here for you. <laughs> another one that way. One another way that he got me was, you know, it's just a matter of time. You might as well just do it. Just get it over with. You know, why drag this thing out? You know. <laughs> well, I didn't. I want you to know that I didn't, but it wasn't because of my own ordinary power. I realized that I went through rehab. I went through the programs. I went to meetings. I did all of that stuff. But I want you to know it wasn't a, a mantra. It wasn't a slogan that I was holding on to. It wasn't even my accountability brothers that I had, and I did have those. But it was the power of the name of Jesus that I called out. And I said, I said God, I, I thank you. I praise you in advance for my sobriety. At two months, I was praising him for six months. At six months, I was praising him for uh, one year because I was putting my focus on him and his extraordinary power instead of my ordinary power because I knew what my ordinary power got me. I knew. I knew very well what my ordinary power got me. I needed something bigger than I was. Second Corinthians puts it this way in, verse, in uh, chapter 10. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So in other words, although we live in the ordinary, we don't fight with ordinary weapons. Did you know that? Through God, we have extraordinary power, and the weapons we fight with are not ordinary. In fact, can we all say this, please? The weapons I fight with are extraordinary. And get this, they provide extraordinary results. Amen? I would say... That is a true statement. So I want to ask you, are you tired of the ordinary? And are you ready for the extraordinary in your life? With all that, we see in this story in, the, in Mark 9, we see it as a collision. Really, there's a collision of the ordinary 
with the extraordinary. We look at a, a father, an ordinary father, admitting that his faith is weak. We see ordinary disciples lacking the faith to cast out a demon on their own. And by the way, in that state of faith, we've been there. It's not hard to draw the conclusions that we do when we were in that situation. We look around. In this case, they looked at a boy and his stuck in his condition. It looked like this boy was even a goner. They even said, he is a corpse. He's dead, right? Have you ever heard that phrase, it ain't over till it's over? <laughs> Anybody know who coined that phrase? Who? Oh, who said that? Good man. Yeah. No, not Yogi Bear, the cartoon. <laughs> this guy right here played on the New York Yankees and then later became the, the manager for the uh, New York Mets. And that phrase was coined in 1973. Lonnie, were, I thought of Lonnie when I was developing this. He would, he would have immediately, he would have beaten all you guys. He would have known it. He would have thrown it out. He probably would have told, quoted what year it was quoted to Miss Yolani. 1973, the Mets were down by nine and a half games in the uh, NL behind the um, Cubs, Chicago Cubs. 1973, so that was a while ago. I still remember that, those times, but I, I have to admit, I don't remember exactly when this happened, but I remember the story. Nine and a half games down in July. July is a halfway point right around this all-star break, and they were down nine and a half uh, games. That's a lot of ground to make up. That means they have to win nine and a half times when the Cubs have lost nine and a half times. That's, there's a lot going on there in order to do that. He said those words, it ain't over till it's over. In other words, as long as I have time, as long as there's still games left, as long as there's still swings in the bat, we have time for something miraculous to happen. They did indeed catch the Cubs, and with one, two games left in the season, they surpassed them to take the NL uh, from the Cubs, and they went on in the World Series and uh, played the A's. Yes, the A's used to be good. Um, <laughs> in fact, the A's beat them in that World Series, by the way, and now they won three get three series in a row. They won the World Series. Yes, they really did. Used to be good, guys. Anybody else that doesn't study base or watch baseball doesn't have any idea what I'm talking about. The A's are terrible right now. <laughs> anyway, the point is, this phrase is famous and timeless, and it's been used in many contexts over the years because it, in, it invokes a spark of hope within us when we are in a struggle it inspires gumption that reaches beyond what is seen and a desire to keep on pushing. Because, guys, again, it's only human for us. Uh, it's natural for us. Uh, if we look at the outward evidence of a hard situation, it's easy to draw conclusions that this is just the way it is, right? It tells us that it also tells us what we're putting our faith in. What are we really putting our faith in? We're we're, we most of the time or oftentimes put our faith in what we see, right? Let's just, let's just admit it. But, guys, here's the thing. We as believers are called to resist focusing on what is seen. When you're focusing on what is seen, you're focusing on the ordinary. If you're going to focus on the ordinary, you're going to miss God's extraordinary. Because what happens when we focus on the ordinary? We start making assessments, well, this is just the way it is. Well, I guess I'm never going to get work. Well, I guess our marriage is going to end. I guess I'm just going to whatever. We start making decisions based on what we see. That's the danger in focusing on the ordinary. We're going to miss God's extraordinary, amen? In fact, that's a definition of faith. As a Christian, look what it says in Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what, about what we do not see. Did you notice that? Confidence of what we hope for. How, how are we doing on that, by the way? That's a tough one. I mean, when we pray about something, are we confident that God has heard us and is working for our best? Did you know? I want to lay a concept on you. The moment you say the word, Lord, all of heaven, the maker of heaven and earth, the one that's threw the stars into space and sustains them by his righteous, uh, righteous mighty right hand, literally stops and listens to you. Did you know that God hears you when he prays? So, again, faith is, goes beyond 
mere information. It's about action. Faith is, a, a, is an expectation that God indeed did here and that he is indeed who he says he is and he can indeed do what he says he can do. It's confidence in God's extraordinary power. That's what we're talking about when we say that. Confidence of what we hope for. That's what that means. So I want to lay a concept on you. It's kind of strong, but here it is. We lie to God in prayer if we don't trust him after prayer. That's a harsh statement, I know. But it's true. It's just lip service. God, I believe you, Lord, move in this situation. As soon as we say amen, we're already assuming that he's not going to move in it. Like, I don't see anything going on. I guess I'll have to take matters into my own hands. I guess God's not going to bring back my unsaved loved ones. I guess God's not going to do anything in my marriage. No, we're, we're, we're not really being truthful in prayer if we're not believing him after prayer. See, it's confidence in what we hope for, confidence in God's extraordinary power. In other words, faith can be thought of as simply taking God at his word. Amen? So again, faith goes beyond mere information. It's about action. It's an expectation. You ever think about that? Faith is an expectation. It's praying and then expecting God to move in your situation. <laughs> Man, I'm bringing it back to myself. I'm telling you what, that would have, I would have gone nowhere if I prayed about God to help me to be sober and didn't expect him to do that. I know my track record. That would have spelled disaster for me. I was putting literally all my chips on that number, that red number seven, that he's going to do something in me extraordinary and give me the power to get through each day. And he did. But I expected him to do that because what, that's what faith is. Because if I'm not working on that expectation muscle, just like we go to the gym and lift weights, it's the resistance of the weight that builds muscle. Well, I don't know. I don't want to go to the weight. I don't want to go to the gym. It hurts. It's tiring. I don't have that inch kind of energy. Well, then you're going to get what you get. It's the resistance. It takes resistance. It takes strength. It takes discipline to place your faith in an unseen God, when you're, especially when you're not seeing things right away but you're building your expectation muscles up as you're placing faith and saying, God, I know you were faithful then. You'll be faithful again. You are who indeed who you say you are. I tell you what, even if you haven't tasted and seen, even if you haven't tried them, trust me, every time he proves himself faithful, then you build on that the next time. And then you build on that the next time. Well, there hasn't been a first for me, Pastor. Okay, well, then let me propose this to you. Why not just double down, give God a chance? We will refund your misery if it doesn't work. Right? Right? What, what's, what do you have to lose? <laughs> yeah, it is true. <laughs> So we need to get our expectation muscle working correctly. Notice it also in, uh, in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, an assurance about what we do not see. How does that work, assurance of what we do not see? Is that even possible? I propose to you guys that is the very essence of hope, assurance of what you do not necessarily see yet. Come on now, give me, catch me here. Catch that because too often we pray and we're waiting. I don't see it. And our hope starts dwindling. No, hope isn't seen. <laughs> hope is not something that we see. We pray and we believe that God is who he says he is. And then we wait in hoping. We're waiting in expectation. In Isaiah 40, it says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall walk and not run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That word wait in the Hebrew is synonymous with hope. Wait, hope, wait, hope. It's the same idea. In fact, the NIV says those that hope in the Lord. Waiting and hoping. That means hoping and waiting. <laughs> Not giving up. Not assuming that God didn't hear us or that he's punishing us or that we're getting uh, our just desserts or I guess this is just the way it is. I guess I'm just going to be ordinary. No, you're called to extraordinary. Your marriage is called to be extraordinary. You know why? Because your neighborhood needs to see an extraordinary marriage. Your kids need to see an extraordinary marriage. Trust me, there's a lot of other examples out there for our kids to see these days. 
right? But you need to see and be in an extraordinary marriage and see what God can do. We need to be an extraordinary church, not just an ordinary church. You get what I'm saying? So hope is about assurance of what we don't necessarily see. So lest you think I'm making that up, look what it says in Romans 8. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Get that. Hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? You see this theme here? Faith, assurance of what we do not see. Hope, hope that is seen is no hope at all. So we see the seen versus the unseen. We see the ordinary versus the extraordinary. And so I just submit to you that when we operate in faith and hope, God can take us out of the ordinary and into his extraordinary. If that's true, then I have to assume that the antithesis of that, which means the exact opposite, polar opposite, is true. And that if we're not operating in faith and hope, that maybe God cannot take us out of the ordinary and into his extraordinary. We're talking about unwavering kind of faith. Faith that's not reliant on circumstances or physical evidence. I hope I don't embarrass my precious brother and sister, but um, precious uh, couple here, the Millers, recently celebrated 75 years married. (laughs) 75. I hope to live to be 75, and they've been married 75 years. Isn't that crazy? You think that they haven't had times in their lives and their testing of their marriage and their walk with the Lord where they've had to hold on and just hold on and hold on and hold on and believe that God is who he says. That's, that's how you can say you've been married by, for 75 years. It's not because of anything that we bring to the table, right? I'm speaking, I'm speaking for you guys, but I know your story. You're so precious. It's their belief in the Lord and that he, even the times when he's quiet, and you're praying, and you're waiting. Did you know that the teacher is always silent during the test? (laughs) The teacher is always silent during the test. But we misinterpret that silence. We misinterpret the waiting time. We misinterpret the time where we're being asked to just hope when there's no hope at all. We misinterpret that. We put it back on ourselves. That's an indictment. I I guess I'm off the team. Maybe this isn't for me. I guess God's just going to let me suffer. Whatever the case is, when the whole time he's been doing something behind the scenes. Because he heard you the moment that you asked. Amen. I want to look at this statement here. God is calling us to be unwavering in our faith and hope in him. He is about to do something extraordinary, and we must pull ourselves out of the ordinary or we will miss it. That's a strong statement there, but that's true. It's in your notes. I hope you'll take note of that. So indeed, it ain't over till it's over, <laughs> right? And in fact, I'll go so far as to say nothing is over until God says it's over. So getting back to Mark, Mark 9 and our story, let's take a look at the father in the, in the story. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he, said, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. I believe the essence of what Jesus is saying is is if. Hey, there are no ifs in the kingdom of God. (laughs) There are no ifs in the kingdom of God. Anything can happen and God can do anything. By the way, it occurs to me in this story, as demonstrative as it was, I mean, this boy's being thrown onto the ground, uh, convulsing, foaming at the mouth, thrown into fire, thrown into water. And, and as this man's telling Jesus the story, you don't see any trepidation at all in Jesus, do you? <laughs> he didn't even flinch. He didn't say, oh, wow, really? Hmm. Man, no, no. How long has he been like this? 
You know, he, he's not intimidated. This is the same Jesus that was asleep on the ship, right, in the stern while he's being tossed and all of his disciples are losing their minds and thinking they're, gonna, thinking they're going to surely sink. And he just stands up and says, peace, be still to the storm. And he says then, if, hey, there are no ifs in the kingdom of God. Anything can happen and God can do anything. Amen. And now look at the response of the boy's father. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Guys, I believe this is a very honest response. In your quest to grow in faith, grow in hope, have patience, waiting for God to move, trying not to give in to discouragement, you might as well be honest with the Lord. <laughs> there are going to be days when you're hurting, when you're suffering, and, man, and, it's, and, and that, that hope muscle is, ooh, you know, it's pretty weak. And that faith muscle is barely holding on. God, help me in my unbelief. I believe. Help me in my unbelief. I, I, see, the, I see this man giving an honest response. There's no denial or sugarcoating here. I believe he's basically saying, I do believe but I have to admit my, my faith is weak. I mean, your own disciples couldn't do anything. Help me with my lack of belief. I heard you have power to heal, so I'm here. I like that. Did you know it's okay to admit to the Lord that your faith is weak? You might as well. He knows it anyway. <laughs> that last statement I said, Lord, I, hear, I heard that you have power to heal. So I'm here. That's a good statement. It's not in your notes, but let's say that together. Uh, Lord, I heard you have the power to heal, so I'm here. Let's say it. Ready? Lord, I heard you have the power to heal, so I'm here. Lord, I heard you have the power to heal. I believe. It's a little belief, Lord, but I see all this other stuff. But I'm here. See, this man's faith, as small and ordinary as it was, it would have been so easy for him just to stay in the crowd, to stay over there. But he didn't, did he? He pressed in. He came to see Jesus. His faith, as small and ordinary as it was, it literally triggered an extraordinary display of power from heaven in this situation. Watch Jesus go to work now. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit, you deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. It also occurs to me that Jesus didn't say, I command you in my name. <laughs> you notice that? I mean, I don't want to split hairs here, but he didn't have to say that because he was him. He was himself, right? Jesus was on the scene himself. God, the Son, and all the power of heaven was right there standing on the scene. Now, Jesus isn't here physically in body, but you know what? You know what? Uh, who is here? His spirit. We went over that on Wednesday night study about how Jesus said, I must go so that the spirit can come. He will remind you of everything I have said. He will empower you. He will convict of sin. All of the different ministries of the Holy Spirit. But the same power that was exerted to raise Jesus from the dead is now in us. So now I say in Jesus' name, Satan, get behind me. Jesus didn't have to say that because he was Jesus. He just said, come out. Well, see, I'm not going to try that on my own, am I? <laughs> I hope you don't either. You can ask the seven sons of Sceva about that, about how that, how that goes. No, in Jesus' name, though. In Jesus' name, Satan, get behind me. You're not going to come in. You're not going to enter my family. You're not going to disrupt my family. You're not going to disrupt my home. Get out of my head. Get out of my marriage. Get out of my business. Get out of my future. In Jesus' name. See, it took the father laying down his extraordinary, again, to receive 
God's, I mean, excuse me, laying down his ordinary in order to receive God's extraordinary. I say to to you guys again, guys, the power of God can change any situation. I want to ask you, what do you need today? Do you have enough faith to bring it to the Lord so that he can do a miraculous and extraordinary work in you in the situation? I just said this. I'm going to show it on the screen now. Let's all say this together, please. It took the father laying down his ordinary in order to receive God's extraordinary. That's good. And now as we close, let's take a look at the disciples. It says in verse 28, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, he replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. Some manuscripts say only by prayer and fasting. Okay, what's that about? Well, this insinuates spiritual warfare, right? It, inv- it, in- it insinuates a prayer habit that is more than just a little quick one-minute prayer, or I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna send text messages out to people. Hey, pray for me. I'm struggling right now. Okay, I'm good. That's not spiritual warfare. <laughs> Satan, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to tell you something. Satan is not at all intimidated, and he does not fear you at all. Newsflash. What does he fear? He fears your power. He fears your power. I believe they have seminars on how to keep you unaware of the kind of power you have as a believer. Keep them confused. Keep them discouraged. Keep them tempted. Keep them distracted. Keep them busy. Boy, everybody's busy these days. Just don't let them know who they are and whose they are. (laughs) Right? That's what this is talking about, the kind of spiritual warfare that's more than just a little quick one-minute prayer popping in and popping out. It's about praying with power, praying in the Spirit, praying through, like we used to say, sacrificing our schedule, denying self, pressing through and pressing through and pressing through until we see the breakthrough. Amen? I wonder how often we give up too quickly. I know there are some prayer warriors in this place. In this, in this church, and that's awesome. But we need more of those. There's an old cartoon that shows two men digging. They were digging for a treasure. And look how close they were to it. But they gave up. They weren't seeing any results, and they just gave up. They quit. I wonder how often we've been that close to our breakthrough, and we just quit. See, faith and hope keeps pressing. And no, I'm going to see it. 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 Again, we'll return your misery. We'll refund your misery if this whole thing doesn't work out. Why not stick it out and see, just see what God can do? (laughs) Press through. See, that's what faith looks like. It's the kind of faith that is confident in what we hope for and assured about what we do not see. That kind of faith that brings out the ordinary in us and lays it down. Literally, I'm laying my ordinary marriage, God, at your altar. I'm laying my ordinary victory and temptation. And I've been doing too well lately in that, Lord. I'm laying that down. I'm laying down my anger. I'm laying down my fear. These are ordinary. They're used, they're, they're, they're common to me. I'm laying down my uh, negative attitude, all of that. That's ordinary for me. I'm laying that down, God, because I want to make room for your extraordinary. You get what I'm saying? Laying it down, fully expecting that God can then do something extraordinary with it. That's what faith is, guys. Amen? Now, that's the kind of faith that can move a mountain. I've never seen a mountain move, but... uh, Sure, I'd like to be, be there when that happens. Until then, I know that God can move, move mountains, but you know what? He, at times, he also just wants to move me. <laughs> Amen? And that's another thing, too, about this whole thing about praying and pressing in. 
What's that all about anyway? This idea of praying and fasting and pressing in. Does God have a score sheet or something? Do you get extra points for the longer you pray? Okay, I guess God says I'm, he must be really serious. He's been doing this for three days after all. Do we get extra points? It's not, it's not, that's not what it's about. We're not trying to show God how spiritual we are. What is it about? It's about pressing in. Yes, giving God time to work, yes. But it's also, guess what? It's about spending time in God's presence. I, I ride a motorcycle, and one of the sayings that we say in motorcycling is that it's not about the destination. It's about the, the, the journey. You know, you set out, and you go, hey, let's go to so-and-so and have lunch. But it's not about going there and having lunch. It's about the ride. It's about testing God out in this whole situation. God, I've heard that you can heal. I'm here. I want to go on this ride. I'm going to, I'm going to do this, Lord. I'm going to press in. I'm not going to give up. I, I believe that you're going to do something in it. You're going on this journey, and you're going on this journey, and you're still waiting for that breakthrough. You're still waiting for that, that, that you're hoping for and that you're believing for, and then you're still pressing in. You're still pressing in. You're looking for it, and then one day you realize, wait, what was it I was pressing for? All I know is I've been in the Lord's presence, and it's changing me. Somewhere along the way, we forget about where we're even going as God's changing us with his presence. It's all about spending time in God's presence. We're putting our agenda aside and plugging into the source of power. Guys, guys that, what it is, that's what it's all about. It's about power. It's about being full of the Spirit, full of him, less of us. This is a, um, I want to read you a quick quote from one of my devotionals that I did recently. I do one every morning, and this one was good. In particular, it says, It is so important to get to know our Heavenly Father, to spend time in His presence, bowing before Him, confessing His holiness, worshiping Him, honoring Him, and magnifying Him. Although we are engaged in spiritual warfare with a hidden enemy, no enemy can overcome God's majesty or His kingdom. Yes, God trains our hands for war. Yes, we will learn about the strongholds and tactics of the enemy. Yes, we will wield the spiritual weapons God has given us to overcome him. But first, we must understand the importance of being in our Father's presence, hallowing his name, just as Jesus instructed his disciples to do. And us, our Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus set that example. What I'm saying here, guys, is that the more time we spend in God's presence, the more his presence and power change us. Is that true? You prayer warriors out there, would you vouch for that and say amen? I mean, yes, you bring your requests to the Lord. The Bible says in the book of Philippians, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything with thanksgiving, bring your requests to the Lord. Your prayers, your petitions, your requests, absolutely. And what happens? The exchange, I give you this, Lord. What does it get back? The peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful of my life. See, that's the exchange that's going on there, but we can't do it without faith and hope and just popping in and saying, well, God, I'm praying about this, but I'm quite certain you're not going to do anything, so I'm probably already working on plan B and all that. That's not faith. That's not hope, guys. Amen? That's not anything that we can stand on. I know I couldn't have stood on that. What I'm saying, guys, is look at this. The more time we spend in God's presence, the more his presence and power change us. That is what it's all about. So we can do battle with the enemy strong in the Lord and in his mighty power and see the extraordinary in our lives that he has for us. Amen? You believe that? I believe it. I'm standing on that. I'm standing on that for you. I'm standing on that for our church. By the way, can I just say real quickly, I know last week we was busy and the Holy Spirit kind of interrupted our service, but I love that. It was a good interruption. Um, 
But I wanted to spend a little bit of time and just thank all of what happened, thank all of the, you that were involved in what happened with the picnic, and then, but specifically what happened before we even went to the picnic and that graphic that was shown up on stage, which is now back there about the building program and the funds and the, and the pledges of those that have committed to help us see that dream. And again, again, what is the dream that we want to build? We want to build a nice uh, gy gymnasium so the kids can play or that we want to have a coffee shop, right? No, no. We just want to build an addition so that we can get accessibility to this building so that people with hip and leg problems don't have to negotiate those stairs anymore. <laughs> I think it's a noble effort. And um, I want you to know that, that I know that that was a watershed moment. I know in my heart, as soon as they unveiled that phone board, I know that God was up to something. And things have already happened. I already did go back and talk to the architect, and we got the ball rolling, and we're going to start developing the plans and, and get it going, and I'll keep you updated and all that. Praise God. I believe that God is up to something. I really do. I believe that God wants to do something extraordinary in this place. But the question is, is that what are we going to do meantime as we're praying and hoping in him? That's the key. We keep hoping. We keep pressing. Amen. Who knows? You might be almost to that treasure. Don't give up. Amen. I hope you got something from today. It's 1108, 1109 now. Um, what I want to do is I want to pray a prayer of conclusion. If you need to leave, bless you. But I also want to leave time to pray with you if you'd like to come up for prayer because I believe that God wants to release you from something ordinary in your life and give you something extraordinary. So let me pray. And we'll dismiss, and then I will stay here and pray with whoever would like to be prayed for. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your, your presence today. We thank you for what you have said and done and will do. We thank you, God, for uh, your stirring in our hearts, God, that you are indeed about to do something extraordinary, Father. I just pray, God, that we would have the faith, God, to stand up and just to raise our hands and say, I'm going to keep on pressing in. I've heard that you have the power to heal. Lord, here I am. God, as we want to give in to discouragement, as we want to give in to doubt, in Jesus' name, we stand strong so that we can do what the Word says, that when we've done all we can do to stand, we just keep on standing because we will see the victory, Lord. I pray a release right now in the name of Jesus. I replay a release in this church right now, a spirit of release, Lord, that we would have the audacity to release the ordinary to you, God, and uh, believe in the extraordinary. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. We love you. I'll be up here. Let's, I want to pray with you if you'd like to.